The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. Welcome to Gen XYZ, where we bring in a contemporary topic every week that is relevant to the youth. And today, something that is affecting a lot of us, affecting a lot of the youth that is studying, that is within schools, that is even the people that are in universities, uh, something that they have to commonly face is online education, something that is common across occupations, across platforms, and something that has been in discussion for quite some time. But we see that the levels of people having accessibility to online education and how it has been working in the real world has been quite different. So there's a lot of uh, conversation to happen there. So before we go into that conversation, I have, it is my great honor to introduce you to you, our co-host, who will be joining us on Gen XYZ, Anradhi Vikram Singh. Of course, you will have met Anradhi on uh, Law, Land and Liberty. She does the very special segment on the law in the land, and uh, she will be with us on Gen XYZ. Anradhi, how are you doing today? <laughs> Pretty excited for this discussion. <laughs> All right. Um, a lot of important things to cover and two very important people who are with us to take us through this entire thing. I'll give a brief introduction and then let's directly go into the topic. Uh, our first guest is Buddhika Patiraja. She's the Principal and Assessment and Curriculums Program Manager at Alithia School and Alithia International School. We are also joined by Ravinath Piris, the Managing Director of Royal International School, Kurunagala. A big commute to come to our <laughs> studios. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so let's just uh, get right into the discussion. I'm going to start with uh, Ms. Buddhika Padiraj. Um, you, this is your field, I'm sure. Questions you get from parents, children, now the media also. Uh, and it's, a, it's a difficult task and it is a task that a lot of people had to do a lot of adjusting to. And I believe schools did a great role in that and they had to stay home and there's a lot of things that you all had to do oh, which might some, some people would have not even thought of for a long period of time. Uh, my first question is going to be, how exactly have you all adapted to this online education over the years? How has this affected you? What exactly is this online education? How does that, you know, like you know, in the real world, how has it you know, changed? Is it now something consistent, something constant that you all are facing? Or is it still changing? Are you still adapting to it? Thanks, Danitu, <laughs> for having us. Uh, to begin with, I think online education, as we know it right now, is a COVID response more than anything else. Because we suddenly had a situation where children could no longer come to school. So we had to get the school somehow to the children. Why? Once children go past grade two or three or four or five, there's no coming back. If we did, our children wouldn't finish school until they're well into their 20s. So we had to do something. So it's a response to the situation. And I think everyone from those schools with resources and without have resorted to some way of getting schooling to the children. And that's what online education is right now. A, a very important context, and it's something I won't really catch on is you mentioned that grade one, grade two, those are not years that we can come back to. Those are essentially the formative years of most children. Uh, and it's not only one, two, it's from across the spectrum, everyone had to go through this. How has it been like managing all of this? I want to, like, I believe Anurad will also like carry this forward. I want to ask you again, how has it been like? It's, is it still a difficult task for you? Well, I think you need to get a bit of context in as well, because there are schools with a lot of resources where when the school closed back in March 2020, there were schools who uh, adjusted quite, I think it was overnight where mm. they actually got Microsoft Teams set up and school was more or less replicated to a cloud. Mm -hmm. But then you have those schools where there's no way that they can afford an investment that large. So teachers have gone above and beyond to reach out to those children, whether they send work through WhatsApp, or whether they recorded the lesson and put it on YouTube, still those schools are struggling the same way. So I think 
th that that I think essentially something that you portray is accessibility. Something I want to really take from. I want to really like dwell into that in deep when it, when it comes to our second segment, a very important topic that you bring up. Anurad, if we carry on this conversation. Yeah, uh, I would like to actually add up on Danil's question. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ravinath, I'd like to ask you, uh, regarding online education, there's quite the negative light that has been shed right now. And as we know it, there are, there's a stark difference in resource availability, as Ms. Budhika said. Uh, what do you think is the slight positives that you could see in the immediate change to online education? There's definitely some sort of advantages that came with this distance learning. So yeah, thank you for having me. And no, you're right, the elephant in the room is obviously when it comes to online education, the accessibility issue, the device issue, and, the, and in the case of some households, electricity. But if we take into account and you know, assume that all things are equal, and that every household, school, child, teacher have access to all you know, the same resources, there are plenty of advantages. Like for me, the biggest advantage I see is that it opens up an opportunity to rethink education as we currently know it. Like in Sri Lanka, we've talked so much about how you know, education's very textbook based. The teacher exactly. teaches straight off the textbook. The child has to memorize it. But right now, you know, that's not entirely possible. Uh, you can just think of so many ways. Lessons can take the form of videos podcasts and even for those schools who can afford it, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality, these are the technologies out there available to, you know, countries with resources. And even I think maybe some schools in Sri Lanka. So, you know, it's a completely immersive learning experience which is out there. And more more or less the child has the freedom to, you know, study what he or she wants. There can be more self direction, you know, if they're interested in, say, uh, take a random, like engineering, there's enough resources out there on the internet. So that would be like the biggest advantage I see. But it's, ob it's not a very obvious advantage. But I think if we really sit down and discuss education in the context of you know, this pandemic, which again, I think I had to agree with what Ms. Buddhika said, uh, you know, this is a COVID response. This is not a sustainable situation. We need to go back to the way we were doing, as in physical schools, very necessary. But online education does have advantages. And if I, you know, a few other things off the top of my head, uh, say the flexibility it gives us, you know, geography-wise, kids, teachers, they can access education, lessons from their house, from their room, study from their beds. And you know, if a kid, a student misses a lesson, most schools with the facilities available, would record the uh, sessions so the child can go back at any time he or she wants to and access the uh, lesson. And one other uh, advantage which I've seen, especially from the context of you know, my school, and I think Buddhika might agree, we, we found out that the, the parent is suddenly more accessible. Like if you take, you know, maybe look back at your own childhoods, your dads, your moms asked to come into school for a parents' meeting to discuss your performance. What's that, a 10-minute conversation, maximum? Mm -hmm. And if you're lucky, <laughs> you know, maybe <laughs> a very much Definitely. sort of conversation. Yeah. But right now, <coughs> parents, moms, fathers, they can, all they have to do is to log in to, the, to their phones from anywhere in the country and, you know, meet their teacher. But again, I have to re-emphasize the playing field is not equal, unfortunately. But if we consider the advantages out there to online education, these are some of the things I really would, you know, would like to talk, list down. All right. Um, Anurad, if I, I just want to ca carry on that same question that you asked uh, from <coughs> Ms. Ravinath. Uh, Ms. Budhika, now, advantages. Since we have the topic of advantages, I don't want to like, extend it to any other segment. Let's just talk about it right now. Do you think the students, do what, firstly, what advantages do you see? Are they opposed to what uh, Mr. Aminat was mentioning? Are there other things that you have witnessed throughout this? And if you could add on within your answer, do you think students, teachers, parents were pushed to understanding new things, to getting hold of technology when, when, when they were told, of, told to use technology back in the day? It was more or less granted. You know, it was like, 
you know, we are going to school, we have textbooks, let's just, let's just do the normal thing. But now we have to uh, abide by this new sort of principle. We have to abide by, like, you know, work with new technology. How do you see all of this? Well, if you look at the children who are in our schools, like it or not, these kids will be the tech industrial experts in time to come. Exactly. And at some point, technology will lead, whether it's our economies or you know, our social lives, it will have a big role to play. And these children, more or less, I'm talking about mostly those children with access, would have grown up with a device at home right at their fingertips, w they would have had internet, they would have had uh, Wi-Fi and, you know, it's nothing new. So using technology to learn isn't entirely a new concept for the children. They would have been given a device by parents to maybe keep them calm or distract them or, you know, as a reward for eating. <laughs> 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 so it's nothing new when it comes to digital devices with kids. And at the same time, the future holds a lot of technology for them. So why not give them the chance to you know, explore what is already available out there for these children? Right now, they might be consumers of technology. But once they get used to it, once it becomes second nature, they will learn faster. They will explore more. So why not give that advantage to the children? But you have to remember, this is a COVID response. It's not a... Um, a driven program for everyone to reach that level or equalize the accessibility. We need to keep in mind that there is a lot who do not have these facilities exactly. where we do need to work a lot on you know, making it accessible for those children. Can I please share a story where the children without, like uh, Ravi said, there are households without electricity. If there's no electricity, there's no point in talking about devices or internet. And there might be families who are heavily affected, those families with daily wage dependent families who would not be able to afford a device. Forget electricity. So there are stories because I know Alithia is a government registered private school. So we have access to forums where we meet other principals from the vicinity. A lot of stories about how difficult life is for them. So as much as those Schools with resources have all these advantages. We have to remember, like Ravi said, it's not sustainable, but we do need it. So right. how do we get there is a big question. <laughs> it's a big question. I think something both of you emphasized very well was the fact that we have to go back to something that, that, that interaction, that physical interaction should again be brought back. And in the next segment, let's talk about why it is so important and you know why, because that really focuses on the disadvantages of all of this. Uh, so we are going to dwell into that. Stay with us on Gen XYZ. to Gen XYZ, we are in conversation about online education and we have two individuals who are in the field, who are in the front lines, one would say, who have taken this fight forward for education. Ms. Bhutika Padiraja and uh, Ravinath, Mr. Ravinath Pei is the Managing Director of Royal International School and Ms. Bhutika is the Principal Assessment and Curriculars Program Manager at Elithia School and Elithia International School. Once again, thank you for joining us. Um, Anradi, something that I want to explore based on both the answers that I got was why we have to go back to this new norm yeah, and like definitely. consistently sh they mentioned on accessibility. Yes. If, if there is something that we can really like discuss <laughs> on accessibility, Andra, where can yeah, we go? Yeah, so I would like to actually uh, emphasize on what Danidu has just mentioned. Both of our esteemed guests here have obviously seen the ups and downs and everything there is to be experienced in this online learning world, even before the pandemic, because they are pioneers. So let's just address the elephant in the room. Accessibility, mm. that is our problem right now. So. I want to ask you, how have you seen accessibility being met, the disadvantages, the problems that come, the shortcomings, technology gaps and things like that for schools that are not exactly as provided and of course not as flourishing as uh, you would expect normal Colombo schools to be. So how do you think accessibility problems and issues have been met in the real world as we speak? Um, um, yeah. Anyone, yeah. So if I can take this. Uh, so accessibility, I think we can further you know, narrow that down to three aspects. It's not, when you say accessibility, we are talking about a connectivity. 
be the device and three electricity like we mentioned earlier so there are families with maybe you know uh, not having all three of them there may be families just having the device but no connectivity or there may be families having connectivity and one device but several children so these are issues which we faced in you know in my experience and again buddhika can add on to that so speaking so taking into account accessibility uh, it's a it's a massive issue uh, and from personal experience i know of parents who to get a wifi connection to download whatever worksheet or whatever has been sent they had to climb their roof to you know a better signal issue but and i it's clearly the main problem when we talk about uh, online education but then on the other side we need to remember that sri lanka as a whole according to the maybe 2019 census uh, statistics we've had 10 million mobile connections 47% uh, internet access and 31 million uh, mobile phones registered in the country and with 71% broadband capability so yes accessibility is an issue but there may be also something uh, you know more more to that but i think there is also a lack of uh, understanding of how uh, technology can be used for better and certainly for education because as we talked about in the previous segment uh, people who may have phones may have other priorities you know it may be yes, linked to their jobs they can't leave the phone behind and say if you have children of a very young age you can't just give them a phone and leave leave it behind right and here comes the other disadvantages of online education uh, taking with accessibility being the main one you know <coughs> people say uh, kids are isolated uh, they don't have any social interaction with their peers sp uh, especially the, the you know grade, say grade 3 and below where social interaction plays such a huge role in their formative development for instance i have a niece who's 2 and a half and now she's taking online lessons she doesn't you know she sits for 2 minutes and runs off mm -hmm. so it's it's really hard to translate a online program to a age you know of of to such a low age and then you have other disadvantages like you know stress levels for parents stress levels for the grandparents stre the stress for teachers i think we all forget the fact that teachers stay at home with families with children of their own and try to balance uh, their online teaching hours and their own personal lives and uh, you know it's such and i would like to take this opportunity to really thank the teachers out there for playing such a massive role in uh, you know adjusting to the new normal which uh, and you know we talk about the front line doctors nurses you know the soldiers the police but no one's talking about the teachers and i think at some point someone should uh, but again when you talk about disadvantages you know i think maybe miss buddhika can elaborate on it you know this whole stress seems to be the other than connectivity stress seems to be the keyword but i ask you like in the absence of online education so in the absence of physical education where kids can go to school i think if they weren't anything online what's the alternative okay. so i think that's something people need to think of yeah. so as a best alternative one would say this has really like played out so oh, one thing we can agree on across the board is the fact that this is the reality that we are facing as of now and this is something that we need to you know carry forward and oh, may i add yeah, something please, please to do, yeah. what he was saying because yes the <coughs> teachers role has not been given enough significance um i'd, I'd like to add some evidence to how hard the teachers are working so there is this one school right in the middle of colombo district but you might say it's more of a remote school without a lot of resources so there are a lot of parents who have come to colombo for work for various reasons and there are children who cannot be located right now maybe they have moved back to their villages maybe they have just simply disconnected and for those families in this particular school the teachers cannot reach out to them so the past pupils of that school have got together 
had struck a deal with the nearest communication center where the teacher whatsapps the work to the communication center parent walks all the way down to the communication center gets the work takes it home gets the children to complete brings it back for the communication center to whatsapp it back to the teachers i mean in a world where it's very transactional these days you know you don't do anything if you don't get anything returned but these teachers they've mm. not given up mm. they've adapted to such extent where they would put the reload for the child knowing very well if they didn't the child will miss that lesson and like i said you can't go to the next grade without getting the basics of the grade that you're in and then we closed school last year so the children who would have been in grade three need to be in grade three so these teachers are doing a fantastic job and i think heroism is a very slow very everyday process uh, and we put a lot of significance on uh, deserved significance for the doctors the nurses like ravi said but when are we going to talk about the teachers and what they are contributing to these children the formative years like you said is key mm -hmm. and not to mention if you don't do your olivers this year you have to somehow do it before exactly. you can proceed further so that's something very very important we need to at some point give the recognition to these teachers mm -hmm. well deserved recognition all right i think some uh, very important line of thoughts that you bring to under the on on these thoughts something that was mentioned in passing was the stress factor the, stress the mindset factor, yes. behind children students all these stakeholders yes. the mindsets are different but they're facing a similar issue oh, uh, how how exactly if if you could explore with the guests how exactly that is affecting maybe let's start with students and uh, yeah. you can go from that point onwards i feel like that? we do not stress enough exactly what goes on behind the screens mm -hmm. we can't say it's behind the scenes anymore <laughs> it's behind <laughs> the screens and we cannot stress the fact that the entire thing where we can list accessibility down into uh, like uh, we our guests said into three uh, we can't fathom exactly how many subsections these three have and one of those key subsections i feel like plays a massive role in all of these connections would be stress would be <coughs> mental health would be things that are not actually regarded in this time of confusion and rush and trying to get your zoom link uh, to work so could you please uh, mr miss budhika would you please just give us a small background on how teachers and students mainly the students are actually handling all of this stress all this unknown confusion and of course this pent up feeling okay um i think before we talk about online education induced stress we need to look at the conditions they were in before these children are is any way a stressful environment yes <laughs> <laughs> these children born i would say mid 2000s to late 2000s those are the kids that we have in school these kids would have known a device from the day they were born for various reasons like parents giving that device to keep them distracted or reward them for something you know preferable a uh, preferred behavior perhaps for eating you know <laughs> staying calm and not disturbing um whatever the reason they've grown up with devices and those devices have come in as a tool to keep them you know under uh, a desired condition in the household so if you look at the household condition we have growing divorce rates we have a growing number of single parents domestic violence we have all these conditions which were already there way before the pandemic you think a, a, a child whose parents are divorcing are not having stress that's an enormous amount of stress for that child and then these children also have known social media from the time that they can actually remember so what does social media do it it's a uh, um, Uh, a tool where you don't stick to one thing you just keep scrolling down until you find something even that you know the attention span is very very limited where you just move on so you have this situation where these children are connected to the the rest of the world but they are so disconnected from those who are around them it is not just social media but it is also that a uh, social setting where the parents might be busy doing their own thing the siblings might be on a different uh, uh, agenda with their own lives now that stress from the family background stress from social media 
bring the pandemic into the situation, you have all these people confined into one room. You would have aging grandparents, fighting parents, all the siblings who might have frustrations over whether it's relationships or jobs or whatever there is. Can you begin to quantify the amount of stress within that household? Forget online education. So in one sense, online education gives access to the children to see a familiar face like your teacher, like your friends, you know, a distraction from whatever is going on uh, inside their houses. Because way before online education or the pandemic, me, I, I, I have dealt with children who come to school to get away from home simply because the household is too chaotic. And, and over the last 15 odd years, I've seen how parents react, how children react. And only when the children overreact, you know, they, they show an odd uh, overreaction to something very small and you keep talking to the child, you get to the bottom of, you know, there's a problem at home. So stress has already been there on these children for the longest time. The stress that I can see induced by online education, yes, it can be health related because we have much less physical activity due to the confinement. But you can't say they were not seated when they were in physical school. They were seated for the longest time during lessons in school. But comparatively, you had enough physical activity to counter that, which is now absent from the, the whole setup. But is it anyone's fault? No. It's the crisis, it's how we've adapted. It's something that we need to, as parents, as adults, do some light stretches in the morning as a family. Simple solutions are there if you look for it without trying to blame anybody. Stress is there. We have to find our ways of dealing with it within our households. Right. I, I want to carry the conversation from that point onwards. Very important line of thought. Uh, actually understanding that this is the situation at home. I think this is very important that uh, we are aware of this as well. Uh, Mr. Raminath, I want to ask you if we convert now from this point onwards, if we are to look into a more conclusive oriented, more solution oriented discussion as rightfully when Ms. Mudika uh, rightfully pointed out, these are technology natives, one would say. They, they were born yeah. into a society of technology and still they are facing these issues. How do we adapt to that on a psychological level? How have you, on, on, the, on, the, on the ground level, like you all are facing these issues, we are asking questions, but you all are facing these issues on a, on a daily basis. And um, productivity is affected, efficiency is affected, everything is affected. How, how have you all decided to you know, mitigate this? How do you all mitigate stress maybe, mitigate the psychological impact? Is there a way to do it? I think uh, Ms. Udhika really touched on some things like physical exercise. Uh, how about you? Mm -hmm. So I like to agree with uh, yeah. Buddhika when she said stress from online education, yes, but stress, there's more stress from various other sources. But when it comes to online education and as a school or as educators, how we can try to mitigate stress levels of these children you who are used to devices, we need to agree on that. Uh, you know, it's simple things. Like I've always found the smaller the classroom, the more engagement we have with the kids, more interaction from the teachers. Well, very simple, you know, the teacher calling out the student by his or her name. You know, little, little things like that helps to mitigate whatever stress is there when the child is seated in front of a laptop or looking at a tab or a phone. Or, and then alternatively, you know, I think we've introduced, not only we, I think most schools around the country have introduced uh, physical exercises so you know, there's a session in the morning where the kids have to wake up, <laughs> dance around, just stretch. Then there are sing-along sessions organized, and you know, art competitions. Just ways to distract the children from you know the biggest cause of stress out there, which is the pandemic. You know, and at some point, I think we we may be not making a mistake, but I think children also need to realize uh, at a certain age that this is actually the ground reality, that there's a pandemic and we all need to adjust. But we as educators, we try our best to you know, hide them from the harsh realities this world has to offer. So little, little things, you know, just, just make, yeah. <laughs> just to add to that, times have changed a lot where we need to re-look at how we parent as well. Mm. 
because end of the day you're trying to sort of find a way to help a child emotionally which is all you know the cause of behavior problems you know you them not listening to you or them continuously you know going against you we need to figure out why it's happening exactly. even if a child lies to you there's a big psychological reality behind why a child would behave in a certain way so unless we understand that we are just hitting in the dark to find a solution <coughs> and if you look at parents who uh, overreact to various you know offenses as they say it's not really the child's behavior the moment the parent overreacts it's the parent's behavior we need to look at but at the end of the day we are all human beings we would have all been through certain experience and we are the sum of what we've experienced as children and we would have got hurt or sad or angry at some point and that definitely will affect how we think right now so should we dump that emotional baggage on children when they misbehave is a question i think we need to reflect on we need to separate our problems and help the child because the child is in a in a a storm of emotional you know turmoil and exactly. at that point the parent has to step back so those were some extremely uh, pertinent issues and of course very crucial points that were addressed by our esteemed uh, guest stream guests and of course there's a lot more to discuss on this psychology issue and how we can of course formatively change our behaviors in this online uh, environment and of course it's a lot to navigate so uh, let's discuss further on gen xyz right after this short commercial break Welcome back to Gen XYZ. Let's continue our conversation on online education with our two esteemed guests. Now, uh, we spoke about all the negatives, all the positives. We spoke about the current situation. Now, on a finalizing note, what do you think we can take away from this entire experience from the online learning world? What do you think are lessons we can carry forward to the post-pandemic world and things that we can actually keep with us that will help us? Uh, and help of course the students that might be watching us right now um chai yeah um undeniably technology is going to be the way into the future so we need to talk about literacy and literacy as we know it is reading and writing but if you talk about digital literacy it's way beyond being able to type or uh, do a google search or access your email we are talking about information that we find whether it's actually true whether the source is credible or not we need to be able to tell whether this information can be used whether we have the rights to use it so we do need to educate those who are you know walking into this digital world whether whatever they find on a google search first of all whether it's credible whether it's uh, correct information and how do we use it ethically and responsibly we can't just take someone else's work and reproduce it as our own so we are talking about copyrights plagiarism where in the absence of knowing what these things are you'd simply be misguided so someone has to come and tell and educate that those things are important as well and we need to know about cyberbullying which is something that you seem to you know take off as an isolated topic and talk about but it's well within the digital literacy aspect of being competent digitally so online harassment cyberbullying being able to keep yourself safe online is part of digital literacy so we need to make sure that all those people who are going into this you know tech online education are digitally literate so that's one key component that everyone from you know the government down to any organization has to stress on so that's one and then we have uh, exposed like ravi mentioned before a lot of new tools into the classroom we were that traditional pen paper pencil you know mode of learning and now we have like 
podcasts and video clips and virtual reality and augmented reality and you know so much that we know about how did we get to know about it because we were pushed right to the deep end of technology overnight and those are good things so we need to look at teaching using all these modalities in you know a, a blended modality way of teaching where we uh, combine these new resources into how we teach. We also need to look at how children learn. So they are now exposed to you know audiovisuals and different technology. So we need to see whether they are going to just you know sit, zip and listen to the teacher <laughs> like we expect them to. No, they are distracted. And we're talking about attention spans of children which has I think dwindled to you know goldfish proportions <laughs> if you may <laughs> say. So we do need to look at how children learn as well. If we can, if teachers can prepare lessons where we talk about um, why we're learning what we're learning. What, why is it useful for us? Why do we need to know it? Why, what are we going to be able to do with it? That will make a lot more sense as a child, you know, and motivate me to make an effort to actually learn. And we can also touch on emotions because children are sensitive. That's something that has come through generations, you know, without a, a lot of changes. Everyone's sensitive. So if you emo emotionally appeal to them through your lesson, you'll have a better connection with your child to actually learn. And in the absence of, you know, I would say that every teacher manages to convince the child this is something that you need to know. So we can resort to making it fun, make it mad fun for them to learn. and they will naturally go and learn and you know and you can use all of these tools to actually make it happen so these things that we've learned through these you know it might be a crisis but i think the tech boom into the education sector might be one silver lining making children more career ready and you know tech savvy yeah. uh, and prepared all right, a lot of important things said there I, I want to take that same question to mr ravinath as well on uh, lessons learned that you have had to face. Now, I'm pretty sure when you have to face teachers, parents, children, they have issues and you have to provide solutions to those issues. So what are the general things that you have had to keep repeating? What, what have you had to be on record telling people, you know, you know, it's not like this, it's like this, you know, take this in the positive way. Are there st things like that? What are the lessons that you have learned in this in this scenario? So I think Buddhika touched on quite a few points. You know, when it comes to parents, it's how to use the device. So and very technical related issues when it comes to you know if there's uh, now I think we use Microsoft Teams. I think but that's the wide most widely used uh, platform across the entire world. So teaching uh, the teachers and the parents that platforms like this, how to access these platforms, that has been one of you know, the biggest challenges. And we get so many calls every day. We can't connect, we can't connect, we send the password, you have, a, so the lesson's not there. So it's these micro level issues, I think, which you know, have been continuously coming on. And this, I think, links uh, very well with what Buddhika mentioned about digital literacy. So but which a lot of people mistake with computer literacy. So sending an email, typing out something, accessing the internet, that is not what we should be aiming at. You know, we should be teaching and at a very macro policy level as well, focusing on how, you know, we as a country, giving this, you know, making people digitally literate. That I think is one of the most crucial elements, not just for us as a school, but as the future for our country, if we don't want to be left behind. Right now, we are preparing kids, you know, say a grade one child enrolls to 2021, they're out in 2034. I'm very bad at math, <laughs> I assume it's 2034. And we are preparing them for a world, you know, which without a doubt, technology is going to be the main factor. So, for instance, um, uh, you know, during 2020, uh, there's a bit of research done on Sri Lanka and the use of technology. And the largest use of technology, uh, the no largest number of hits on YouTube, which is a fantastic source of educational material, is for songs and movies. So 
we have access, and like I said before, 47% internet connection, which is a fair amount, not ideal, but fair. But uh, users are still accessing things which may not be beneficial to them you know, during a pandemic period, like even students, uh, young adults. If we can teach them okay, how to navigate the digital world a bit better, you know, I think at a policy level there needs to be mandatory curriculums uh, designed to you know, insert digital literacy into our current program. And the other lessons learned, and this may not be a lesson, but it's more of a reflection. Uh, I think we've all had conversations where we complain that uh, the education system is prepping our students for a very memory-based exam. You just pass the exams. Exactly. And uh, a lot of the root issues in our country come because of uh, schools are not teaching students how to think critically, how to solve problems, how to work in a team, how to communicate. And these are, I think, there are, I think there are a few more skills out there. These are the established 21st century skills, which you know the entire world is trying to uh, focus on. Mm -hmm. So COVID-19 uh, has given us, and I think you know, in every dark cloud, there's a silver lining. <laughs> you know that very cliche, the old <laughs> saying. This has opened us. Uh, this has made us rethink, given us an opportunity to have a conversation on where our education system should be going towards. I slight example again, like we've all been brought in a system, or if we're uh, brought in a system where we, end of the term, there's an exam, a written exam, sit down, two hours, write what you can from memory, you'll get a grade, and that continues on and on and on and on, till you know we leave school. but. In a pandemic situation, we can't send a paper. We can't, you know, peer over the shoulder of a child to make he or she's not copying. So this has forced us to rethink, you know, so many things. How do we assess our children? It's we had to move. We are moving away from the traditional now. And I think this is one of the biggest lessons we can take from the pandemic, and uh, and I think there needs to be at a very high level, uh, some sort of intervention mm -hmm. to, you know, I hope I'm not saying something too <laughs> controversial, <laughs> no, right. but I think this is accepted fact. Yeah. Our education system needs to change. change yeah. Definitely. And uh, last and, you know, and again, nothing, no policy changing the education system. Nothing's going to work if we don't address the connectivity issue, exactly. the accessibility. Right. Um, if I couldn't just give Ms. Budiga the, the last word in, we have about one minute left. Uh, in short, the message that you would like to give to the teachers, to the students that are going around, they are facing a bit of a, I think both of you also in, in leadership role have been facing these issues day in and day out. What would you like to mention? We are in a crisis. Let's not deny that. We need to accept the fact that this is not normal at all. But there are good things that we've learned. There are good things that we can take forward, which we need to do by all means. Let's not stress on what we don't have. Let's make the best of what we do have and move forward the best way possible. <laughs> Be strong, stay strong, and keep your sanity <laughs> intact for when the crisis is over. <laughs> All right, I think some very good words to go to an end. Andradi, that was yeah, quite that an interesting discussion. Any yeah, finals? it was definitely quite the interesting discussion. I feel like all the students that are watching us out there will actually realize that this mm. change is not completely permanent, but it's not completely temporary either. And I feel like that's something they'll be looking forward to. Yeah, of and something important that you all touched on, and this is not overnight change. This is something yes. that we had to really look Definitely. at. We'll look at on a, on a long time basis. So thank you so much for shedding light on all of these uh, subjects. Uh, uh, Ms. Buddhika Pajraj is the principal and assessment and curriculum program manager at Alithia School and Alithia International School. Uh, Mr. Ravinath Piris, the managing director of Royal International School, Kurunagala. Again, a big commute to come here, and you have here you've been here given us a very important message to take home to really think about uh, thank you once again for joining us uh, i thank our viewers for joining us and on behalf of andrade vikram singh our co-host i'm daniel thanavasam uh, thank you for joining us on jnxyz join us again next week as we bring in another contemporary topic a weekly issue and discuss it with how it's relevant to the youth 
Um, this has been Gen XYZ. Thank you for staying with us and have a great night.